Hi Monica, thank you for inviting me and allowing me to present at this conference in the form of a, of a movie, since I can't go to Barcelona myself. I would of course have liked to join you all, uh, but that will have to be another time. The title of the talk is Stability and Degradation of the Organic Solar Cell, Past, Present and Future. And it's a title that, that Monica and I arrived at together. Uh, it's of course highly unusual that, that you present a video instead of being physically present and presenting at a conference. But Monica uh, would really like me to present this view. Uh, so this is what I'm going to attempt here over the next half hour. And there's no doubt, uh, in, or there should be no doubt in, in, in anybody's mind, that the ISIS as a concept, as a conference, as an organization, as a movement, is extremely important. Uh, not only to me, but to all of us, but it's something that I value very much myself. Uh, and it's something that, that certainly I will support. I support the whole idea behind it and also the, the motivation of, of all the people working together at this central um, challenge of understanding and improving uh, the solar cell stability, the novel solar cell types uh, and, and their stability. Now the ISIS-3 conference was, was hosted here at DTU uh, long ago and it proved tremendously important in many ways, just like all the other ISIS conferences, but to me, because it was hosted here, this was of course important. And we had several uh, important uh, articles came out of it with all of us, or the majority of us, working together on these uh, massive pieces of work. We also had the ISIS standards that came out of it that, that people are, are using today and that perhaps need slight adjustment, but I think they are very still very timely. Uh, and I certainly hope that this seventh conference uh, in the ISIS series will grow even further and establish the ISIS spirit as something that is, that is not only permanent but also very useful to, to the solar cell technologies. I also hope that this format of presenting can become useful uh, not only to this conference but also to others in the future. Uh, and it certainly does allow us for a new dimension in, in the art of presentation. Uh, and in the case of, of my talk, we've chosen to divide the past, the present and the future into different scenery and explore that dimension in the talk. Let me take you back to the early days of the organic solar cell. Back in those days, the, the major feat was that you could make a solar cell where the active layer was constituted of an organic material. That in itself was a, a marvelous discovery. Uh, at, at that time, people didn't think so much about the stability of it. And it was clear that, that uh, well, I'm convinced that people have tried it. There were papers that, that wrote uh, small passages about or indications about that they've considered stability probably because a reviewer asked for it uh, but nobody really wanted to address it initially uh, the main concern was to achieve high efficiency and demonstrate that you could somehow uh, achieve a photovoltaic response with an organic material and you could also understand perhaps the physics of it and especially how the physics was different from how we understood the inorganics or the well-established solar cell technologies now then as the the third generation or and in particular the organic solar cell moved on it, it moved on quickly uh, for several reasons uh, and I'm going to come back to some of those but certainly the in terms of um, future the organic solar cell it did away with a lot of the limitations that existing solar cell technologies had and this was certainly the driving force of the research and it's clear that once you claim that you have a new technology uh, that replaces some technologies that are known, then people will eventually ask, well, how about stability? Or somebody will. And this gradually came along. And initially, nobody understood why they degraded. The stability studies were, were limited to simply uh, preparing devices and then studying how the photovoltaic response decayed. And we started then to, to take the cell apart uh, and, and look at what had happened. And in the very early days, most of the active materials were constituted or made of uh, polyphenol and vinylene, vinylene type materials, PPVs, that are very photochemically unstable. So they bleach quickly. Uh, and this led to a lot of studies where people used uh, simple absorption measurements, of course also the, the uh, decay of the photovoltaic response, but also trying to really elucidate the mechanisms of, of degradation through 
uh, understanding the chemistry of the degradation products. Partially achieved in some studies by isotopic labeling, also various other sorts of advanced methods of post-mortem analysis of the solar cell. It has to be borne in mind at the time that those solar cells were, were small. They were made typically prepared on glass by spin coating. And this certainly, when, when the object that you are studying has a certain outline, that also puts limitations on, on how you choose to study them. And, and this, I think, transcended the degradation studies that were made the first decade of this new millennium. Uh, and it gradually moved uh, on to that, but that you will hear about uh, in the next session. So I'm going to uh, just briefly now outline how the understanding then developed uh, from having realized that they were unstable and, and that it was, they were very unstable initially. We are talking maybe minutes or, or at most hours. And clearly we need years or more to be useful in front of an investor, in front of a funding organ or somebody else. At least we needed to claim this at the time. And these people, of course, did. And we started to take this seriously. And, and the whole community around ISOs, actually, uh, or pre-ISOs also, looked at how to not only study and elucidate mechanisms, but see if we could change something to the constitution of the device to improve it. And I think the first real examples of somebody who, who, who moved the the simple observation, or move from the simple observation of degradation to actually altering the chemistry and the constitution of the device such that stability was improved, started maybe around 2004 or 5, where uh, systematic studies, uh, based on the, the rudimentary understanding there was of the degradation phenomenon at the time, moved. And you have to remember that at the same time, not only materials change, uh, the, the, the search for high efficiency led to a change in the, the materials we used, also devices uh, in terms of architecture changed. Still, the majority of studies were on rigid glass, small substrate sizes. So this certainly limited still the, the way we undertook the studies. But there was a gradual change in the way the organic solar cell looked like. That of course also led to a change in, in how we chose to study the degradation. And one very important line of research was then when they reached a certain stability, that we started moving outdoors. So moving out in the element that, that the solar cell is typically intended for, at least if it's for bulk energy production, you would want to be outside somewhere in a large area. Uh, organic solar cell devices also gained area, at least in some cases, and, and those became modules and were then studied outside. Uh, and over from the years 2000 to, to 2010, we saw this change the gradual change from, from small glass substrate to larger modules, some of them still on glass, but also on flex. Uh, and this whole thing moved, uh, as did the need to try and at least agree on, on how we, we should measure, how we should report uh, the stability of the organic solar cell. And the ISOS community has a large responsibility for this, and I'm sure that we will have in the future also. So now I've moved from the past, where I gave you the brief intro before, where I was situated next to our solar tracker outside. I've moved up, uh, and on to my side here, I have a concentrator. And as I mentioned before, the, um, as the solar cell changed its architecture and its, its outline, so did our ways of, of studying it also. And this was reflected in the early days. We used vacuum chambers to, to study the degradation. This move, the bulky, equipment uh, that gradually was streamlined to, to less bulky equipment and as the solar cell changed uh, it became even compact and we could test different atmospheric components in, in a highly compact geometry still on rigid substrates and now we move on to to more complicated uh, studies as stability improved you need more light dose uh, you need higher light intensity to see a change in 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 the performance over time and on my side here i have a our currently uh, highest, most uh, highest light intensity source, which is a solar concentrator that, that works when, when the sun is up, at least. Um, we also have solar concentrators that work indoor when the sun is not up, and uh, based on focusing over a smaller area of, of course, a large light intensity. Now, all these studies gradually moved us to today, where we uh, have uh, an understanding of different phenomena that all compete at the same time. 
So the, the stability and especially the, 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 the degradation or the way a solar cell deteriorates or in operation um, is an effect of many, many competing causes of death. And by changing the, either the constitution of the device, the outline, the materials, the constituents, the way you prepare it, you can of course provoke one particular degradation or failure mechanism and remove others. And ideally, of course, we should remove them all. But it's one thing is certain, and as it's understood today, is that, that you, you can never get rid of all of them. And the, the best view is that you want to eliminate as many of them as you can or suppress them as much as you can. But it is naive to believe that we can fully remove them because decay and degradation is an inherent part of being on the surface of, of the planet or I suppose being anywhere in the universe. Things change over time and this we have to live with. One good example of something that uh, changes uh, uh, or a mechanism that suddenly appears uh, when you change geometry is uh, one of lamination. So me the mechanical failure between the, some of the layers, one or more of the layers in the multi-layer stack that, that constitutes an organic or, or any printed solar cell. Uh, if you are on a rigid glass substrate, you rarely see adhesion as a critical parameter. But if, when you move to a flexible substrate, where you have to maybe print many layers on top of each other over a machine at high speeds on rolls, it runs over rollers, and then suddenly the mechanical failure between the interfaces or between the layers can become significant. So it was a mechanism that wasn't there before and now suddenly it's highly critical, not only in manufacture but also in operation. And this is one of the most recent, you could say, uh, failure mechanisms that I'm sure will gain increasing importance as we move from rigid substrates to flexible substrates. If we look at it broadly, uh, there are several schools or lines of, of uh, degradation paths that, that one can take, all linked to the materials and the way the device is constituted. And the early experiments quickly uh, found uh, photo bleaching for the PPVs and later on for the better materials, less photo bleaching. But especially the photo bleaching was perhaps um, known for a long while, but fully established by, by Mathieu Monceau, who came with a series of papers uh, some years ago. And it sort of put the hammer on the nail's head and it showed not only a method of looking at it, but also uh, it showed us how long a stability or how good a stability we could expect, for instance, for the PFHT PCBM uh, blend mixture. And it was a very positive outcome in spite of the fact that, that, of course, they do photo bleach and react with light in the presence of oxygen and water and many other things. But it showed that you could anticipate many, many years of, of uh, operational stability for this mixture at least. Uh, if you package it correctly. There are several other uh, uh, papers I could mention, but I've chosen here just to pick out a few that I th found really uh, important. But Mathieu uh, traveled the world and did a series of, of um, pieces of work, all centered on the photochemical stability of the organic solar cell, and especially the active layer materials in them. And it led also here to, to um, a series of papers on on rules of thumb, on the photochemical stability as a function of how you make the organic material in the active layer. There was also, early on, it was realized that, that the uh, morphological evolution, so the morphology of the solar cell was known that this was highly important for the, for the performance, the correct or high performance of the organic solar cell. But the change in morphology, which, which is uh, obvious that it could take place over time, uh, would of course lead to change in performance of the solar cell. And again for the PFHT PCBM system there was a really nice paper published on the uh, very long uh, morphological stability of the PFHT PCBM system. And so the morphological stability or evolution of the active layer in the organic solar cell is also a whole area of research where the uh, that it critically influences not only performance but also certainly the stability over time of the organic solar cell. There are, in addition to this, several chemical uh, phenomena other than photobleaching. Uh, reactions at interfaces between metal electrodes, reactive metal electrodes, maybe oxygen, water, carbon dioxide has been reported in some cases. So there are several, uh, at least in terms of the chemistry. Physically, there can be changes. Uh, most recently, as I mentioned, the mechanical stability with, with uh, the extreme case of, of delamination. But 
There can also be, be other effects, also in the periphery of the solar cell, maybe contacts and, and other places. And now we've moved from the past through the present. We're still a little in the present. And I'll also now not only perhaps show a, a glimpse of the future, but at least discuss it also in this final larger part of my presentation. Now, the, um, I mentioned it briefly in the early uh, part of the talk that the whole motivation for making the organic solar cell, what makes the organic solar cell interesting is that it does away with a lot of the things that none of the known PV technologies can get away with. Fundamentally, they can't get rid of it. And for the organic solar cell, it's, it's the simple fact that you can make a very thin solar cell using very little energy and constitute the device such that the complete and operational device embodies very little energy. This means that you can get rid of most of the material that is in the object. And this is what it's all about. This also has a lot of implications. One of them is that if, if our quest for a stable solar cell implies that we need to package it between two glass plates, then you may as well use silicon because silicon is highly efficient and highly stable. So a glass plate is not a future for the organic solar cell in any way. And I would even go as far as to say that unless it, it really can present the same performance in terms of power conversion efficiency and duration or lifetime, then I would always go for silicon. But what the organic solar cell has to offer is that you can make it so thin, so flexible, and you can operate it in this form. And it is durable, at least ideally, in this form. So this is what it's all about. And from this point of view, you could say that the, the whole game has changed because our understanding and my understanding of the organic solar cell is that it cannot be a rigid glass plate or in a rigid form. It has to be in the thinnest possible form as a printed foil where no vacuum is involved and only fast solution processing steps are employed. And this is <coughs> a movement or a direction certainly we have taken. So we moved away from the glass, moved away from indium, moved away from all the elements employed in the solar cell that we don't have enough of on the planet. So we want a solar cell that only uses things that we can either recycle or that we have enough of. And then in addition to that, we want to use little of it and we want to use as little energy as possible in the process of constituting those materials into the form of an organic solar cell or a photovoltaic. Now the uh, solar cell can be printed. This we've done on several occasions uh, and enormous amounts. <coughs> and using only printing techniques under ambient conditions, so no clean rooms or all these other things. And this is really the fact that the organic solar cell, or the polymer solar cell, can be roll-to-roll -roll processed, uh, means that we can make it in, in long or near endless lengths of solar cells. And my advice would be, of course, for those who want to study stability and degradation of organic solar cells, though if you want to move beyond studying the fundamental degradation of the materials in the solar cell themselves, Future studies are more or less only relevant if you carry them out on in the final intended form under the final intended conditions. So this implies modules, flexible modules, tested outside, mounted as you would mount them in, in the intended application, <coughs> and studying their operational stability and also how they fail under those conditions. A new failure mechanisms does emerge. We carried out, as you see here, I'm standing uh, at the solar park, uh, a DTU. It's a 1,000 square meter uh, large array, uh, so four lanes of 100 meters length each, <coughs> where we can roll out organic solar cells. And we've tested uh, more than 500 square meters of solar cell in one go. In this park, we never filled it completely, but eventually we will. And the reason we never filled it is that we quickly faced problems beyond our expectations. Now, the uh, concept operating in this solar park is known as the infinity concept, which basically means that we are connecting the solar cells in series, all of them. This gives us a very high operating voltage, which is a good thing because we can and have shown near lossless uh, extraction of power uh, using this method. And we don't spend any time 
making any more than two connections to our solar cell module. So we don't, everything is connected in the trip. And of course, we were interested in how those solar cells uh, would degrade when we put them outside here under real conditions. <coughs> we tested many, many different uh, encapsulation materials and also methods uh, from several different suppliers. And uh, contrary to our expectation, we observed uh, a lot of failure in some barrier materials that were supposed to be the best barrier materials <coughs> and others that were supposed to be less good uh, provided much better stability performance. Also, we expected that water would be a bigger problem than, than it, it is in actual fact. <coughs> and we found, of course, we, we didn't expect that high voltage could be a problem. You have to remember that the solar cells here behind you, at least the top lane that you see behind me, it's been outside here for one year and five months as we speak, and, and it's still fully operational. Now, surprisingly, having 10 kilovolts of operating voltage and only a thin plastic barrier of less than 100 microns to separate the solar cell from the outside world seems to be operational outside. And when I say it seems to be operational, of course it means that it is, but it also means that we've observed new failure modes that were highly unexpected. Of course, it's clear that if you have high voltage, you would expect a short circuit to, to be a disaster. And it, I can confirm that it is. Uh, a solar cell of this kind, that is 100 meters long, gives about, when it's freshly prepared, 260 watts. Today, it gives around 190, after nearly one and a half years. And if a spark uh, suddenly is induced, it will sustain itself as long as it's illuminated, and it will keep going and just burn away not only the solar cell, but also the surface on upon which it is mounted. And this, of course, has significant implications if you want to employ this solar cell in a building. And I think any flexible OPV that is ever to be operated outside, even at lower voltages, if this failure is possible for us here, it will also be possible for these cells. So this is certainly something you'd have to bear in mind if you want to <coughs> design a building that employs OPV. You want to make sure that it doesn't set the building on fire. And it's certainly something you cannot exclude, at least if you install it in this thin foil-based form. We've of course also experimented with avoiding these shorts and have made some headway. And I'm sure that 2015, which is not far into the future, but certainly into the future, will enable us to fully cover this without those catastrophic failures where not the park burns down, but the solar cell modules take fire and stop operating. The whole system here is fenced in and is grid tight and the two small rows that you see behind me are both uh, tied to the Danish electricity grid uh, where we test how the high voltage systems <coughs> work together with the Danish grid and there are some legislative issues there that certainly apply to Denmark but I'm sure they will apply to all the other countries where people would, would think of making experiments of this kind. Now, so when we look into the future, we have to go and study degradation, as I said earlier, in situ. So we have to make the devices in the form, in the intended form, and we have to study the degradation in the intended form and try to elucidate mechanisms there. I'm not saying that we can't go back and use some of the historical measurements that we developed 10 years ago and used maybe five or even, even longer ago, but it, we need to progress not only organic solar cells, but any printed solar cells, such as perovskite cells and kestroids, etc., whatever we can think of, that would fit into this pocket of thin printed solar cells. We have to go as close as we can to the application, not only to push it into society, but also to make the degradation studies that we spend a lot of our academic time on, to make them as meaningful and as impactful as we can. Going to the intended form, of course, also implies that new failures can emerge that we didn't expect or perhaps could expect but didn't expect to that extent. One good example is what I mentioned earlier, mechanical failure that has been little studied so far. But the solar park concept here where we roll out the solar cells and if we want to demount them or remove them again, we roll them back in. I suppose their failure is not so important, but when we roll them out, failure can of course, mechanical failure at the, of the device at that point can of course be critical because at that time the solar cell has an enormous value so there you want it to be 
of a sufficiently mechanically robust stature that you can roll it out and operate it. And you would also want the process of installation to not affect the operational stability in the actual installation. So there are a lot of new areas that are trivial as they may seem, are highly complex, not studied, and highly relevant for the future of the organic solar cell and also the novel printed solar cell technologies that I also am almost convinced that they, to gain edge, would have to follow more or less the philosophy as you see here behind me. And now we're coming towards the end of my presentation. And you'll, note, you'll have noticed by now that, that the, all of the recordings, except perhaps the very first introduction, has been done outside. And that is, uh, of course, because the weather is good, but also because we believe that, or I believe, that the future is outside. Uh, and it's a very important message to all of you that to study the stability and degradation of, of the printed solar cell, we have to be outside. We have to be in situ. We have to be where we want the, to see this perform in society. One thing about the future is, of course, that nothing is, is really certain. Uh, and I think, and I hope that what I've shown you, a brief glimpse of uh, the work we do here with large scale, both manufacture, but also installation of the organic solar cells outside and the new failures that we observe as a consequence of it makes the future, or illustrates how uncertain the future is in spite of all our calculated efforts. Uh, I think it also shows that th there is uncertainty as to, for instance, standards. A lot of ISIS is about trying to standardize both measurements and reporting, but certainly also the thin film form. And I think it's, from that point of view, early to settle on a fixed standard for a flexible solar cell, when we don't even know what it's gonna look like, we don't know who the end user is going to be. We don't even know what form we are going to install it in, how we're going to install it, and how even we're going to use it. We know that it's going to produce electricity for us and energy through harvesting sunlight. But aside from that, we know very little of it. Now, and I would like to close here by thanking Monica and all of you uh, for listening to this and allowing me to present in this highly uncommon form. The, if you have questions, uh, I suppose one of the uh, unhandy things about this mode of presentation is that I'm not there to answer them for you and not there to discuss them with you. But I do have four of my highly distinguished colleagues with you, Nieves, Michael, Giselle and Soren, and each of them have their uh, special capacity in my group and they will be more than helpful uh, if you approached. Also, I should say, I would love to enable studies on all these new solar cells. So if you need solar cells in the forms we can provide them, uh, then ask Giselle, Surin, Nieves, or uh, Michael, and we will provide you with samples. If you have good, good study to do it, if you want to spend time on it, we will give you as many as you like. So I hope that the ISIS conference will be as successful as all the previous ones have been, and that it will last, uh, and there will be and ISIS 8 also in continuation of ISIS 7. Thank you for listening.